And welcome, everyone. We are so incredibly happy to have you here for today's event, hybrid, both live and on a webinar on Zoom. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to join us. My name is Elizabeth Cronk Warner, and I have the privilege of being the Dean at the SJ Quinney College of Law. My pronouns are she and hers. And anytime we gather together, I do like to start off with a land acknowledgement statement and that we here at the University of Utah acknowledge that this land, which we're currently on in the Salt Lake Valley, was named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshu, and Ute tribes. We recognize and respect the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. It's my privilege to introduce um, our panelists and moderators uh, for today's discussion. Um, so first, panelist George Contreras is a presidential scholar and professor of law at the SJ Quinney College of Law. He also serves as director of the college's program on intellectual property and technology law. He is a cum laude graduate of Harvard Law School, and he holds both a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Rice University. He clerked for Chief Justice Thomas R. Phillips of the Texas Supreme Court. Professor Contreras' current research focuses on the development of technical standards and the use and dissemination of data generated by large-scale scientific research projects. Among his many past and current positions, Professor Contreras serves co-chair of the Interdisciplinary Division of the ABA Section of Science and Technology Law, and as member of the Advisory Board of the American Antitrust Institute. He has served as co-chair of the National Conference of Lawyers and Scientists, and he currently serves on the Scientific Advisory Board of the Utah Genome Project, which I'm sure is relevant to today's discussion. Next, panelist Lynn Jordy is professor and is the Mark and Kathy Miller Presidential Endowed Chair of Human Genetics at the University of Utah School of Medicine. Dr. Jordy earned his PhD in biological anthropology with a specialty in human genetics from the University of New Mexico, where he also earned a Master of Science in Biological Anthropology and a bachelor's degree in anthropology. Dr. Jordy's laboratory has published more than 250 peer-reviewed scientific articles on human genetic variation, high altitude adaptation, the genetic basis of human limb malformations, and the genetics of common diseases such as autism, hypertension, juvenile, idiopathic arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease. Through nonprofit organizations, he has provided genetics education to hundreds of state and federal judges. Among his many positions and accomplishments, Professor Jordy is a past president of the American Society on Human Genetics. He currently serves as chair of the society's government and public advisory committee, and he is a member of the Research Advisory Council of the National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH. Last but certainly not least, our moderator for this evening's event is Professor Erica George. Professor George is the Samuel D. Thurman Professor of Law at the S.J. Quinney College of Law, and she also serves as the Tanner Humanities Center at the University of Utah's College of Humanities. She serves as the director, excuse me. I think I failed that. I missed that important point. Um, she also earned her J.D. from the Harvard Law School, and she holds an M.A. in International Relations and a B.A. from the University of Chicago. She served as law clerk for the Judge William T. Hart of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. Professor George's current research explores the responsibility of corporations to respect international human rights and various efforts to hold business enterprises accountable for alleged abuses. 
Among her many other appointments, Professor George is the chair of the advisory board of the American Bar Association Center for Human Rights. She serves on the editorial board of the Cambridge University Press Business and Human Rights Journal, as well as serving as special counsel to the Women's Rights Division of the Human Rights Watch. So with that, it is my great pleasure to turn the stage over to Professor George. Professor George. Thank you, Dean Cronkwarner, for that very gracious introduction. And if you were listening closely, you heard no science or technology in that. So I wanted to tell a story to introduce um, my colleague, who will tell you a story about this case. And I would submit to you that this case is about many stories. I'm going to share the story of my relationship to this case. In 2009, when the ACLU filed this case, I was on the board of Utah's ACLU. We learned about this case from National days before what was to be our fundraising event here in Utah, um, just to give us a heads up that they planned to sue the university and Myriad Genetics and basically many people who probably would have been supporting our dinner. And I thought it was curious because it seemed really out of the lane of the usual kinds of fare that the ACLU board considered. Um, but then it started to make sense as I thought more about it. Um, framing it as an issue of who gets access to information to engage in scientific study, the extent to which we take that off the table or limit it by patent law. Not a patent lawyer, but somebody deeply interested in access um, as a human rights issue and as an issue that affects women. Um, my story also is I know many women who have survived breast cancer and some who have not, um, my mother being one of them. And many women didn't have access to early detection, didn't have access to treatment, and anything that was remotely approaching a barrier to that was something I felt really called to think more deeply about. And so after that meeting, um, and a few months later, I happened to be at an ALS meeting, American Association of Law Schools, where a dear colleague, Kaylee Murray, who actually is an intellectual property lawyer, was also curious about this set of issues. And from that conversation was a three-year journey, um, filing amicus briefs and just raising different constitutional kinds of claims that might inform or influence this debate. And a debate it did become. And a mini headed hydra of arguments that um, I'm honored that my colleague has invited me to help talk through because his work really dove deep into the interests, the positions, and the personal stories of the people who were affected by this ruling. Um, the scientists who do research to create treatments and detect, the women who were seeking treatments, their lawyers, and their families. So who owns DNA is the provocative question that he begins with. And I think this is more than an inquiry about mere competition in the marketplace. It goes to the deeper eternal questions of what is owned and what can be owned. Um, what is appropriate to consider claiming ownership over? What needs to be free? What do we do with free inquiry? And how do we create categories that govern how we're going to work with new ideas, with experimentation? Um, this work is comprehensive, it's fascinating, and I would suggest to you that it also is not over yet. Um, so with no further ado, I give you my colleague to tell us his version of so many versions of this story. Thank you, George. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you so much, Dean Cronk Warner and uh, Professor George, for this uh, opportunity to uh, to speak with you about a uh, a book and a project that I've been working on, and I guess it's done now, uh, at least in terms of this book, which has come out. Um, but it's about an eight year long process to, uh, to get here. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about uh, what I did, why I did it, um, and, and what, what this case was about. Uh, for some acknowledgements, I actually began this project at my prior university at, at American University um, and uh, continued it here at the University of Utah. And I'm indebted to uh, many different uh, foundations and uh, centers that supported the work that went into this. <clears throat> so 
as you know, as Professor George indicated, this, this case is a Supreme Court case uh, from 2013 uh, that anyone who's studied patent law has heard of and probably studied to some degree. Um, it began in 2009, or at least was filed in 2009, involved the challenge by the American Civil Liberties Union and the Public Patent Foundation of a number of claims of patents on two human genes, the BRCA1 and 2 genes, and several of their mutations. And from a strictly legal standpoint, it relates to a doctrine in patent law called the product of nature doctrine. So I'm not going to talk about that, really. Um, that, that is it's a technical discussion, and you can get some of that in the book. Um, but that's not really why I wrote this book. Um, the case is an important case, right? A patent doctrine, but, but far more than that, right? It raises issues, as Professor George mentioned, of access to health care, individual rights, and really how the law deals with science and scientific developments. And to me, that's what made the case especially interesting, far more than the narrow doctrinal issue of patent law that was really before the courts. So it's a Supreme Court case, and as a result, there's a lot of commentary about it. Others have written about the case. Um, there was coverage in the popular media, right? Uh, but I found that coverage to be somewhat incomplete. Um, also somewhat partisan, uh, really on both sides of the debate, whether or not genes should or shouldn't be patented. Um, there's academic literature, of course, a wealth of academic literature about the case, but I'm an academic myself, I write some of this literature, and I know that to a general audience, this literature can be fairly opaque, and it's also partisan. <clears throat> and then finally, um, there is a, a series of blogs and news stories in the legal press, which is extremely partisan, right? And so my view of what was going on out there was this is an important case. It raises lots of issues, uh, both for the law, but for people in general, and it hadn't really been explained adequately in the existing literature. So I asked whether this story could be told in a way that was complete, uh, more than just you know, a short article in the New York Times or the Washington Post, um, but in a way that was also accessible, more so than a, a legal uh, law review article. And I had a number of models to use as I thought about that. The, the book, A Civil Action, uh, was one of my principal models about a sort of scientific-based uh, lawsuit that occurred um, a number of years ago. Actually, the law firm that I worked at in Boston was the subject of this book, and uh, which became a movie. It, we were the villain uh, to some degree in, in the movie and, and the book, but um, nevertheless, it was an interesting story. And there's a whole genre of books about legal cases that are not criminal cases, which most people understand, uh, but which tell stories that can be understood. And so I set out to do that. Um, this is the result of that effort, and uh, you can be the judges of whether that effort succeeded. Right. And so what's the background here of this story? You know, the, the Supreme Court doesn't just get these cases and uh, decide hypothetical questions of, of law. There is always a background. And in this case, the background has a lot to do with the University of Utah. And even though I started this project when I was in Washington, D.C. at American University, it was my move to Utah that really enabled me to meet the people um, and talk with many of the players in the story that uh, I, I probably otherwise would never have had access to. All right, so the story begins back in the 1980s. Um, breast cancer, of course, a deadly disease that affects millions of people, um, seemed in some cases to have a hereditary element. It ran in certain families. And of course, this had been known for a century, uh, but by the 80s, groups around the world had begun to look for that genetic linkage uh, between breast cancer and human genes. In 1990, a watershed occurred, uh, which is when Mary Claire King, a researcher then at Berkeley, uh, through a genetic epidemiology and a technique called linkage analysis, located a gene that she called BRCA for breast cancer on the long arm of chromosome 17, one of the 23 chromosomes that we have uh, in the nuclei of each of our cells. 
This discovery, though, um, located the gene roughly, but it didn't identify the gene specifically. It didn't find the DNA sequence of the gene. Her discovery, though, was the starting gun in a worldwide race to find and sequence the BRCA genes. And so in 1991, the following year, a researcher here at the University of Utah, Mark Skolnick, pairing up with um, Wally Gilbert from Harvard and the company Biogen, and Pete Meldrum, who was a local investor, they formed a company to search for this BRCA gene, which they knew would have great commercial potential given the prevalence and deadliness of breast cancer. They had funding from the venture capital industry, from the drug industry, Eli Lilly Company, and from the National Institutes of Health. Um, at the start, the university granted this company exclusive rights to whatever discoveries uh, Professor Skolnick's group made here at the university, a controversial move. It became more controversial later on. And <clears throat> to make a long story short, and this story has been told in at least a couple of books that were written in the 90s, uh, the Myriad team won this race. They were the first to discover and sequence the gene um, in collaboration with many others. Um, and immediately thereafter, they filed a patent application covering the BRCA1 gene, and that patent issued in 1997, a few years later. So this was just one episode in a widespread race to patent genes. It was going on from the late 1980s through the early 2000s in the United States and around the world. And there were a number of universities who were deeply involved in this gene hunting race. And as you can see, the University of Utah was, uh, was heavily involved in this, um, was actually uh, quite successful uh, in this along with many other universities. But the result was that by 2005, MIT researchers reported that about 20% of all human genes were covered by patents and that number was increasing rapidly. So why did we care about this beyond patent law? So by 1996, when the patent uh, looked like it was going to issue, a myriad began to offer screening tests for the BRCA1 and 2 uh, variants that were most closely associated with breast and ovarian cancer, but so were other universities. The genetic sequences and the mutations were made publicly available through scientific publications. So other universities, including University of Pennsylvania, were starting to screen patients. However, once the patents issued, starting in 1997, Myriad began to shut down those other screening operations. It sued the University of Pennsylvania for patent infringement, Penn ceased testing. Um, and over the next couple of years, uh, Myriad uh, conducted a campaign of cease and desist letters in which it basically shut down other universities uh, and uh, testing facilities so that by 2001, Myriad was basically the only provider of BRCA screening and testing in the United States. <clears throat> um, it did permit academic research to, uh, to be conducted uh, using the genes. However, um, it did not allow academic researchers to report what they found to their uh, research subjects. So if there was a mutation that was found um, in a research study, the researchers couldn't tell that to the patient. Um, the patient had to go get the Myriad test in order to find out the result. Okay, so there were a number of public complaints that arose from this, uh, this situation. One was the price of the test, which approximately $3,200 by the time of this case was not actually covered by many insurance policies, which was problematic for, uh, for many women and men who uh, probably should have gotten tested, could not be afforded uh, by many patients, um, notably Medicare and Medicaid did not cover the test uh, for quite a while. <clears throat> um, the fact that only one company in the country was offering this test also meant that patients were unable to get confirmatory testing uh, from a second lab. Why would you want confirmatory testing? Well, if you got a positive result from a myriad test that you had a deleterious mutation in one of your BRCA genes, that meant you had an extremely high risk of getting breast or ovarian cancer during your lifetime and an eight to 10 times greater risk than the normal population. That meant that in most cases, you were almost certain to get one of these deadly cancers. And the response to that 
often would be a prophylactic surgery, a prophylactic mastectomy, <clears throat> oophorectomy, removal of the, the, the breast tissue or the ovaries to prevent that cancer from developing. But those are fairly serious surgeries, uh, serious medical procedures. Uh, many people are unwilling to get them without some sort of second opinion or confirmatory test. Um, there were complaints that the Myriad testing was not complete, uh, at least uh, during the early and uh, middle period that we're talking about. Uh, the BRCA genes are, are complicated um, and shifting genes. There were large scale rearrangements uh, within the genes that were difficult to detect using sort of a genotyping point uh, checking tests that uh, Myriad usually uh, conducted or that many people conducted. Um, researchers couldn't tell patients the results. There was a sense that there were a general chilling effect on research into uh, not only the BRCA genes, but genetic tests in general. And by the, uh, the 2000s, uh, there were multi-gene tests and panels that were coming online, uh, but that were encountering problems uh, with including these genes or the patented genes in them. So a number of public complaints. So one might ask how you can patent a gene. Um, since the 1980s, the patent office had been issuing patents on human DNA. There was an early case that back in 1980 in which the Supreme Court in a divided uh, five to four decision said that you could patent a bacterium that had been genetically modified. Um, and so with that logic, um, human genes uh, followed closely thereafter. The patent office did find that some forms of DNA, such as very short fragments that were being discovered by people, lacked utility, clinical utility of any kind. So you couldn't patent those, but a full gene that was associated with a known disease that was useful, that passed the test being something useful under patent law, so you could get a patent. There were some academics who were skeptical about uh, patenting genes, but they were outside of the mainstream of patent law. And even though there was litigation about genes and patents, this was litigation between companies who wanted to show that their patents were valid, the other, their competitors' patents weren't. Nobody ever thought or nobody ever attempted to challenge the practice of gene patenting in general. And so one might ask, why isn't anybody doing anything about this situation? And this is the question that was asked by uh, two people at the ACLU's national office back in um, 2004. And I'll read a little bit from the book in just a minute, um, sort of the introduction, like how these two people decided to bring this case. This project that I worked on um, involved trying to understand the origins of this case, which went back uh, to 2004, five years before the case was actually brought, and trying to understand how the ACLU did it, why they did it, why an organization that for 100 years of its history had never brought a patent suit decided to maintain a front, frontal assault on a practice that the patent office had been engaged in for two decades. It was well-established law that you could do this. How did this happen? Um, there were a lot of fascinating litigation strategies and moves that the ACLU made that uh, made this case utterly unique in the history of patent law. Um, one thing that they did was they viewed this is a civil rights case, right? Not another patent case, not a case focused on the patent doctrine, but a case focused on the people affected by the patents. And one of the reasons that they did what they did was breast cancer. There were many patents on genes, many diseases that were associated with those patented genes. But most of those diseases were diseases that the ordinary person had never heard of. Um, breast cancer though is a disease that I would suspect everyone in the United States either has had or knows somebody, either a close family member or a friend who has had it. Um, and, and many of us have lost people um, as a result of breast cancer. This was an incredibly smart strategic move in terms of litigation. Um, the ACLU also structured this as a women's rights issue. The, uh, the women's rights project at the ACLU um, was active in bringing this case, not Coincidentally, this is a project founded by Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the 70s at the ACLU. Um, she, is, uh, she was at the time then on the Supreme Court. Um, 
Another thing that the ACLU does incredibly well is build coalitions. At the ACLU and the Public Patent Foundation didn't bring this case in their own names. They gathered 20 different plaintiffs together to be the people who would challenge these patents. And these people included uh, scientists, uh, medical associations, genetic counselors, um, activists, breast cancer action, for example, but also patients, six individuals who were unable to get tested um, under the current eligibility criteria or the pricing system uh, that was then in place. The ACLU was also an amazing user of the media. And, and patent cases generally don't get a lot of media attention, certainly not outside of patent blogs and so forth. Um, there were episodes on 60 Minutes, The Today Show, um, lots of mainstream media and news coverage of this case that you did not get elsewhere. Um, and of course, this culminated um, in 2013. As the Supreme Court was considering the case, Angelina Jolie, the actress, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times disclosing that she had been diagnosed with a deleterious PRC mutation, and as a result had undergone a prophylactic double mastectomy um, and was, uh, it was a very painful recovery, uh, but she did recover. Um, and uh, she talked about the case in this op-ed, a, a story that became a cover story in Time Magazine and made international headlines. There was of course a media counteroffensive um, by the patent bar and uh, patent blogosphere, um, who from the beginning felt that this case was ridiculous um, and uh, in, in, in legal terms, uh, frivolous, right? So much so that uh, there were moves to get the ACLU and PubPat lawyers disbarred for bringing this case, uh, but that didn't happen um, as it turns out. The case also raises fascinating issues and gives a fascinating glimpse into how the government operates behind the, uh, the, the curtain, right? Of the, uh, the executive branch. Um, the Patent Office, of course, is an agency of the Department of Commerce, which is part of the executive branch of the government. The Patent Office issued these patents and was quite proud of them um, and uh, opposed the ACLU's case from the beginning. But not everybody in the administration agreed with the Patent Office. And a divide formed within the Obama administration as to whether the federal government should support the Patent Office in these patents or oppose them. And uh, Francis Collins, uh, the director of NIH, um, as well as people like the Solicitor General, uh, Neil Katyal, ended up taking the side more or less of the ACLU, not entirely, they kind of split the baby on this, but uh, the patent office director, David Kapos at the time, uh, sort of represented the other side. And there were numerous agencies that had their own patents on genes, like the Department of Agriculture, who were strongly in support of the patent office. But eventually, in an unprecedented move, the Solicitor General of the United States did appear in this case, opposing its own sister agency, the patent office. Um, and finally, oops, we get this. Finally, uh, the public engagement in this case was uh, unprecedented for a patent case. Patent cases, uh, believe me, I, I've been to the Supreme Court um, to, to, to watch patent cases, and, and there are usually not demonstrators on the steps or not people who have camped out overnight on the steps of the Supreme Court to get into the oral argument in a patent case. Um, but that happened here uh, in this case, and um, it was it was phenomenal and uh, quite unprecedented. So, you know, a lot was at stake in this case. I mean, beyond this doctrine of patent law, it says all sorts of things about science and how it's commercialized, whether corporations can control the human genome, access to, uh, to treatment and to medicine, women's health, healthcare, pricing, the insurance agency, or the insurance industry plays a major role in this book and not in a very positive way, competition policy, um, accusations of judicial activism, um, and, and really question about how the law itself is, is made. Um, a 20 year, 25 year precedent can be overturned uh, through the action of citizens who decide that they uh, think that the law is unjust. Um, and what I hope uh, is that in the end, this turned out to be a story worth telling and one that you will 
uh, find um, interesting and informative. Um, but the uh, thing that I do want to leave you with before I read just a little bit from the book is, is really to thank those who entrusted me with their stories. I interviewed almost 100 people uh, for this book at all stages of this case, from scientists at Myriad and the university uh, who worked on uh, discovering the BRCA genes all the way through uh, to uh, some Supreme Court justices, clerks, um, and um, you know, it was amazing. The things I heard were amazing and I'm really indebted to them. And uh, uh, some of these people uh, did not survive till today um, to see this book come out. Um, and so uh, really uh, their memory, I think, I, I hope is preserved um, in this book. So thank you uh, very much for, uh, for this, for this background. And now if we have just like three more minutes, I'll read to you a little passage from the book, which which is an iconic moment um, in, in the story. This is where Chris Hansen, who is a veteran litigator, he's been at the ACLU for 30 years. He's heard all, he's argued all sorts of cases. He's been to the Supreme Court, cases uh, relating to school desegregation, the Brown versus Board of Education, uh, continuation cases, cases involving mental health facilities, online pornography. Um, he is a superstar at the ACLU. Um, and Tanya Simoncelli, who is pretty new, She's young, she's the ACLU's first science advisor um, who gets hired to sort of help them think through scientific issues that might have some civil rights angle. So Hansen's in his office, Simoncelli pops in just to ask him some questions about some issues that she's got on her mind. So this is uh, in chapter one, who can we sue? So Hansen smiled when Simoncelli poked her head into his office. He liked her and as he had told her more than once, thought she had the coolest job at the ACLU. What's up, he asked, pivoting toward her in his high-backed leather chair, the only concession to traditional lawyerly accoutrements that Hansen made. Simoncelli took a seat across the desk from Hansen. She glanced at the only decoration in his office, a disorienting surrealist print by the French painter Yves Tanguy, Hansen's favorite artist. She began by explaining that she was trying to find litigation angles for some of the science issues she had been thinking about. Like what, Hansen asked, his voice was flat and unaccented, betraying his Midwestern roots. Of all the issues you've been looking at, which were the most important? Simoncelli, becoming enthusiastic, sped up, speaking and gesturing with her hands while her words flew. She began with brain imaging, fMRI. If this technology were admitted as evidence in court, someone could be convicted of a crime based on nothing more than electrical activity in her brain. Was there a way to challenge the use of this technology in the courts? Hansen thought for a moment. FMRI sounded like a new gloss on the old polygraph lie detecting machine. They were banned from court in most states now after the evidence proved them unreliable. Simoncelli nodded. Hansen suggested that she might want to review the cases rejecting lie detector evidence. Some of them might be broad enough to encompass FMRI results. Great, Simoncelli nodded, scribbling notes on a legal pad. She moved on to genetic discrimination. Could they bring a lawsuit if an insurance company discriminated against someone who had the wrong DNA profile. Insurers already refused coverage to people infected with HIV. Could a genetic propensity for heart disease or cancer be next? And what about employers? Could job interviews routinely require DNA tests resulting in what one commentator called cadres of the genetically unemployable? Hansen considered the question. It was a good issue, he said, but without laws on the books, it was hard to see a litigation strategy. As Simoncelli knew, the ACLU was already supporting legislation to address the issue, and Hansen recommended that she try to engage further on the legislative front. She nodded, again noting Hansen's suggestions. Then there's gene patenting, she said. Hansen furrowed his brow. Gene patenting, he said, what's that? We discussed it at the meeting in Boston, she said. Gene patents. Hansen shrugged. He hadn't attended that meeting. Okay, said Simoncelli. Last year, she had convened a two-day symposium of top academics and policymakers in Boston to help the ACLU think through possible objections to gene patenting. She quickly summarized what had been discussed. When she finished, Hansen shook his head. That can't be right, he said. Chris, it's right, she said. The patent office had been issuing patents on human genes for more than 20 years. Hansen shook his head again. He was no expert in patent law, but surely Simoncelli, who after all wasn't a lawyer, had to be misinterpreting something. They must be patenting the method for getting the DNA or the function of the gene or something like that, he said. 
That too, Simoncelli answered, but that's not what I'm telling you. They have patents on the DNA. The genes themselves are patented. Hansen exhaled. What Simoncelli was saying made no sense. How could you patent a part of the human body? I don't believe it, he said, show me. Okay, Simoncelli said, rising to the challenge. She left Hansen's office and threaded her way through the corridors and filing cabinets back to her own. She turned on her old PC and once the computer came to life, searched through her folders, pulling up three short articles that explained what was happening with gene patents. She typed Hansen's email address and hit send. Then she waited. 20 minutes later, an agitated Hansen burst into her office. My God, he exclaimed, you're right. Simoncelli smiled. Told you so, she said, only half joking. Hansen shook his head in disbelief. But that's just wrong, he said. How could a human gene be patented? How could the genetic code inside a person be owned by a company or parceled out to different buyers like lots in a housing development? The very notion was absurd. It was offensive. If this were true, and he still had his doubts, Simoncelli was on to something, something the ACLU should get involved in, something the ACLU should stop. Simoncelli was elated by Hansen's sudden enthusiasm. This was why she had joined the ACLU. So what do we do now? She asked. Hansen folded his arms and smiled. The answer was obvious. Who can we sue? He said. And that's it. So thank you for listening. Um, and uh, with that, I'll turn it back to our moderator. Erica, take our seats. Here we go. Well, thanks, uh, George and Erica. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight, both uh, those of you who are here in person and those who are here by Zoom. Uh, I'd like to start with a, a short story uh, about a, a hero of mine, Dr. Max Wintrow. Uh, Dr. Wintrow came to the University of Utah in 1943 to be the first chair of internal medicine in what was then a newly established four-year medical school. Now, Dr. Wintrow was a hematologist, and something that really bothered him was that at that time, there was no reliable, quantitative, standardized way of assessing the portion of red blood cells in a patient's blood sample, something very important, for example, to, to diagnose anemia. So he invented this tube, still known as the Wintrobe hematocrit tube, simply a graduated plastic tube that you can put in a centrifuge, spin around, and then you can see what portion of the blood consists of red blood cells, standardized quantitative. Now, when Dr. Wintrobe invented this little tube, he was advised to patent it. His response was, no, I want this to be widely available, affordable, so that everyone can use it. It was never patented, used all over the world, and still known as the Wintrobe hematocrit tube. So what about patenting human genes? Well, I can tell you, first off, that the vast majority of the human genetics community and the medical genetics community oppose gene patenting. Uh, and George gave some of the reasons earlier. Um, we do regard genes as products of nature. Uh, as George indicated, lack of competition raises costs for genetic testing. Uh, good evidence for this is the fact that shortly after AMP versus Myriad was decided, the cost of testing for BRCA1 and 2 went down by more than half with competition. As George indicated, patient access is restricted. So independent confirmatory tests can't be done. And from our perspective as scientists, one of the most important consequences of gene patenting is a real inhibition of basic research. Uh, my organization, the American Society of Human Genetics did a survey some years ago showing that about half of the respondents said that they were reluctant or refused to work on patented genes uh, for fear that their research, their results uh, would be restricted. Uh, this pertains in particular to what we call incidental findings. Uh, in DNA sequencing studies where uh, those findings, if they affect a gene uh, that has been patented, uh, can't be reported to patients. 
So I want to give you just sort of a case example that is an incidental finding of a harmful DNA variant uh, in BRCA1 or BRCA2. So in this case, uh, we need to keep in mind that whole genome sequencing, that is where we sequence all of your DNA, will reveal a harmful variant in one of these two genes in about one in 200 individuals. So it's not that unusual. These variants, if they are harmful, are considered actionable by the American College of Medical Genetics. Uh, that is, there's something you can actually do, uh, including early surve surveillance, earlier surveillance uh, for women, mammograms, MRIs, and as George mentioned, prophylactic removal of the breasts, which is done in about 35% of women who carry a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, that reduces the, breast, the risk of breast cancer by about 90%. Another option uh, is prophylactic removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes. Uh, that is now considered standard of care for BRCA1 or BRCA2 carriers, reducing the risk of ovarian cancer by about 90%. Well, <clears throat> the uh, ACMG recommendation is to report these results to study participants. And in our own DNA sequencing studies that we do here at the University of Utah, we do find mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2. But under the restrictions imposed by patents, we would not be able to return these results to patients we wouldn't be able to inform them of something uh, that could be life-threatening. And of course, one of the inducements for people to participate in our studies, in many cases, is the opportunity to have results returned to them. Uh, so these are reasons why patenting, uh, from our perspective, uh, is very restrictive uh, for our research. And just to give you this little bit of background, about 2% of us have a harmful variant in one of the 59 ACMG genes, the actionable genes. So when we're doing sequencing studies, we would find a fair number of people with a variant that should mandate some sort of action. But if there were a patent, our actions would be restricted. We wouldn't be able to inform them because we would be doing genetic testing. So for these reasons, uh, the American Society of Human Genetics, along with several other organizations, including the American Medical Association, uh, filed an amicus brief uh, when the case was being considered in district court. Uh, we set forth most of the arguments I just gave to you. Uh, and then more recently, uh, Senators Coons and Tillis, and this is mentioned in George's book, uh, introduced legislation, this is just two years ago, uh, in Congress that would have effectively overturned the AMP versus Myriad decision. So our organization, the American Society of Human Genetics and the American College of Medical Genetics uh, wrote a letter, again, detailing our reasons for opposing patenting of human genes. Now I'll, I'll, I'll mention uh, another <clears throat> story that was in George's book uh, that's especially dear to my heart. By the way, it was a beautifully written book, George. I, I read the whole thing over the weekend um, and, and I, it was actually hard to put down. I can honestly say that. Um, so George uh, tells about a session at the American Society of Human Genetics meeting back in 2011 uh, that I happened to have moderated. Uh, and one of our presenters was Judge Sweet. Uh, from the uh, federal district court case. And I can tell you that he received one of the warmest receptions I have ever seen in my life. 8,000 people were applauding enthusiastically for this man, for the decision that he made. So uh, that's my very uh, uh, brief perspective on gene patenting uh, as a scientist uh, and uh, I, I will be happy to move on to our next topics. Thank you.
Thank you. That's a wonderful segue because I actually want to invite the two of you to talk about lawyers doing science and scientists doing law, right? Um, because there were lots of players in this litigation and science was central to the question until the question changed to become a civil rights case. So um, you are a lawyer scientist. You are a scientist, not a lawyer. Um, what attracted you to getting involved in this and still staying involved in a legislative conversation? Yeah, that, 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 that's a great question, Erica. Um, and uh, part of my interest in this goes back about 25 years now. Uh, my good friend and colleague, Ray Jessland, who's sitting right here, my former department chair, got me involved in judicial education. Um, and I, I knew absolutely nothing about our judiciary system, didn't really know how the state and federal systems work or anything else. Uh, but I was fascinated with the differences in the way uh, judges and scientists think about things. Um, you know, we, we love to overturn precedent. Uh, judges often, as I understand it, kind of work the other way around. Um, and uh, uh, another thing I noticed right off the bat was that uh, scientists always use slides. And the judges very seldom did. Uh, and sometimes when they did, it was kind of a fiasco. So um, I, I guess what, what intrigued me about all of those, all, all, all of that activity was that these, these people, the judges, were deciding critically important cases, cases that really affect people's lives. Uh, and they were very, very smart. Um, but... Their, their knowledge of my science was pretty limited, uh, but they always asked wonderful questions uh, in a very un, uninhibited, and I would say well-informed fashion. So um, I, I was involved with those activities for about 15 years uh, and uh, uh, really in, enjoyed them. Um, so um, I, I think I should, I should let uh, yes. okay. George address that question, that issue as well. Lawyers doing science, since we've heard from scientists doing law. So, um, no thanks. So, um, i take a slightly different tack on, on this. So, so patent law is, is a weird area of law, right? It is, it is an area of law that is practiced primarily uh, by lawyers who have some kind of technical scientific or engineering background. In fact, to take the patent bar exam, which is what you need to practice for the patent and trademark office, you actually are required to have a science or technology degree. And in the biosciences, most patent lawyers or quite a lot of them actually have PhDs um, in some area of science. And so it's a very complicated area of law and patents um, are are extremely strange legal instruments. I think I describe in the book that like the first part is like a, a scientific uh, article written by a lawyer. And the second part is like a, a, a scientific paper written or a, a, a legal document written by a scientist or vice versa. It's terrible. It's the worst of all worlds. And they're very difficult to understand. And so for this reason, for decades, um, there hasn't been a lot of public engagement with this area of the law, um, other than the fact that I think it's well known that patents exist and they give companies like the exclusive rights to do things like why they're granted and why some are issued and some aren't is, is pretty hard to understand. Um, and, and so one of the really interesting things about this case is that the people who initiated were complete outsiders, right? The ACL, Chris Hansen at the ACLU had never taken a patent law case, never taken any intellectual property law um, in law school. He was a civil rights lawyer. Um, and just the idea though, really offended him that patents could exist here. He ultimately, he, he's also a brilliant man, a brilliant thinker and got educated and, and worked with uh, a patent lawyer, like the one patent lawyer in America who was willing to take on this case um, uh, named Dan Ravisher, who headed this organization called the Public Patent Foundation. 
Um, but, but the impetus case was from outsiders. And, and it's a lesson in becoming too steeped in and inured in your own discipline. No patent lawyer that you talked to thought there was anything wrong with what was going on here. It all was very logical from, you know, the 1980 case where this uh, modified bacterium was patented, you know, step by step by step until lo and behold, human genes are being patented um, using this very convoluted theory that, well, because these covalent bonds are broken to take the gene out of the chromosome. It's a different molecular entity than it was in the body. So it is like something that was new and invented. And that Judge Sweet, uh, who, who I really admired and was privileged to, uh, to interview before he passed away recently, um, he said, this is a lawyer's trick. Like we shouldn't be doing this. Um, but, but nobody in the field could see that or was willing to, uh, to say that. So um, yeah, it's a very strong value that outsiders brought to this case. So I, I want to turn to maybe the insider. I'd like to turn now next to the insider outsiders. You suggested that some of this book discusses judicial activism. Yet this was a case, and we do not see this often, if ever, that was unanimous, right? Um, do you care, any thoughts on why that is? Well, so yeah, so the, you're right. If you know anything about the Supreme Court, you know that unanimous decisions are pretty rare. In 2013, the, the court was just as divided as it is today on, on most uh, issues that people hear about. Um, there, there was only one concurring opinion in this case by Justice Scalia, uh, who basically in three sentences said, I don't know anything about molecular biology and neither do the rest of you judges. So why are we even hearing this case? Um, but in terms of active, so Judge Sweet at the district court, what he, he, he was lambasted by the patent law community, um, unfairly, I think, uh, for daring to overturn you know, these patents that, um, you know, again, had, had been issued in accordance with existing law and policy for, for so long. And he was accused of activism. Um, and judicial activism is you know, it's, it's, a not, it's not a complimentary term, right? It is a term that we use uh, when we think judges are overstepping their bounds. But I, I don't agree with that view personally. I, mean, I think this is what judges do in a common law system. Um, judges interpret the law and we expect them to do that. And even if a government agency for decades has been interpreting the law in this particular way, executive branch agencies do not make the law. They think they do. Um, a lot of times, but they don't. It is generally courts who are the final arbiters of the law. And so I think it's perfectly appropriate for courts to do this. Now, the, uh, the legislation that, uh, that uh, Senators Coons and Tillis brought up was an attempt to overturn um, exactly that, uh, those judicial decisions. And Congress is entitled to do that, right? This is how our tripartite system of government works. Congress can do this. Um, but at the judicial stage, I, I think this was perfectly appropriate. And I, I ask because I think it's interesting. I think many of our students are primed to think of this particular judge as being activist or that particular judge as being activist. But here we have the full bench acting together to overturn gene patents. Mm -hmm. I want to turn now to a question that you pose, the big question, who owns your DNA? Apparently we do again. <laughs> um, there's moves to change that. But there are serious questions around commodification of science. Some would say that we need the incentive to encourage research. Um, this arguably inhibited research. Where do you think the balance should lie? Or what are the factors that need to be taken into account? Um, commercialization is attractive. Many people made money. There's a portion in the book um, on page 356 where you point to um, the public mission of the university and research science and the public funding that goes to research. So to the question of who owns what's discovered, what's invented, shareholders, taxpayers, all of us, um, science and the public interest, can that be consistent with commercialization? This is more of an invitation to comment than a question, but I think these are the broad set of issues that you've raised. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I'll also turn it back over uh, to, to Lynn, because I, I, I didn't know the blood column, the, the Winkoff column? 
Winthrop. Winthrop, I did not know that story, that uh, fascinating piece of history. But so, so there are two, two related questions here. Right? One is what should the law allow to be patented? And then the second question is, if patents are granted, what should the entities that get those patents do with them? Um, so both both related, right? I, I do think, I mean, the law for 150 years has been that you can't patent a product of nature, something that's found in the natural world, um, because it's not invented, right? Even if it's, you know, even if it took a lot of trouble to go through the forest and find the mushroom that no one ever knew existed, they didn't invent the mushroom, they just found it. And so finding something is not inventing it. Um, and I think the court got this right in this case. Um, nevertheless, it is true. I, the patent laws in the United States, they actually are enshrined in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution uh, mentions patents. It gives Congress the authority to create patents uh, to encourage useful endeavors, to encourage invention and the progress of the, uh, the useful arts. Um, and so this is important. We, we, and patents are useful, right? Somebody invents a better mousetrap, a better automobile a transmission, they, they should be rewarded. And if they aren't, then they really don't have the incentive to go and develop an even better um, automobile transmission later. And, and I think that's fine. Um, slightly different calculus, though, when we're talking about inventions that are being made, even if they can be patented by publicly funded sources, by basically the federal government, uh, taxpayers are supporting them, or universities with a public mission are creating them. And I think this is one of the, um, certainly one of the issues I, I, I talk about, and this university uh, is one of the universities that I mentioned in the book. Um, universities, I think, should view their inventions and their patents with their public missions in mind and shouldn't uh, act like corporations whose job it is to make money for their shareholders. I think universities do have more of a public mission. And uh, this is why I think this blood tube story is, is so, uh, so telling. And uh, I think uh, really reinforces that um, we are here to serve the public good, the taxpayer, state university, the taxpayers um, of the United States and of this, this state uh, support us and support our work. And uh, so the work should go in large part to the public. And your science for a long time has been in the public interest. Could you speak to your view of temptations towards commercialization, potential pressures, and how you maintain a commitment to a public mission in your science? Yeah, the, <clears throat> that is a great question. And certainly uh, the science of human genetics has become more commercialized than it was, well, 40 years ago when I first came to this university. Um, and just to give you a couple of examples, and this actually kind of speaks to uh, the concern that the Supreme Court decision would uh, would have a chilling effect uh, on commercial interests. Uh, in 2019, genetic testing was a $12 billion a year industry here in the United States. Uh, by 2027, uh, it's predicted to be a $21 billion uh, enterprise. So genetic testing has, has actually grown uh, uh, considerably uh, since the Supreme Court decision. Um, but I think it is important uh, that, um, that scientists not be overly influenced by, by a profit motive. Um, you know, we, we, I don't think very, well, very, very few of us went into our business to get rich. Um, we just think it's interesting. And sometimes it even does some good for people. And that should always be our primary motivation, just as it was for Dr. Wintrobe. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, it seems the story is not over, however. Um, you presented that there's legislation being introduced. Um, what is it that academic researchers can do, lawyers can or should be doing to ensure that this space remains one that is open and accessible? Um, or put another way, does this legislation have a future? I don't know if you care to answer that because you've been involved with 
statements? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> certainly uh, communication is, is very important. Uh, it's, as we know from the whole COVID story, misinformation uh, can, can have just terrible consequences. So I think uh, it's, as scientists, it's, especially as academic scientists, uh, one of our most important duties, obligations, is to try to inform the public about what we do, not just other scientists, um, but uh, uh, the legal community, uh, the public in general. Uh, our department, one of our faculty, Louisa Stark, has uh, uh, runs the Genetic Science Learning Center uh, that provides genetics education in a very, very accessible form. It gets over 100,000 hits per day. Um, so one of the most popular science websites, if not the most popular in the world. Uh, and think of the millions of people who are getting good, valid information uh, from that website. Uh, we need as much of that as we can get. Okay, can you say that website again? And maybe someone can put it in the chat for the Zoom audience, the, the website. Oh, uh, it's called the uh, Genetic Science Learning Center. If you just Google those four words, Genetic Science Learning Center, it's the first thing that will come up. They're very good at uh, website visibility. <laughs> Wonderful. This will be my last question to George, the author, before we open to the audience on Zoom and questions in the chat and in the room. Um, so this is a beautifully written book. It's engaging. It's fun. It's narrative. I have to ask you the craft question as a human, the humanities person in me. Um, can you tell us about your writing process? You've drew together a lot of disparate sources, primary sources, interviews, documents. Um, what does a day in the writing life of George look like? <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks for that question. It's, um, it's interesting because, I mean, of course I've, I've written, you know, over a hundred, like, articles, science, uh, scholarly articles. And I, I actually uh, written or edited like 10 other books. Like none of them was anything like this process. Um, it, is, it is a very different type of writing. And I, I, I knew that to tell this story in a way that people outside of the legal academy or scientists would, would read it. Um, and, and that was my main goal. I, I really wanted the country people to understand what was going on here and, and what had happened in this important moment in history. And so I knew I had to write it in an engaging way. And, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, I, I, my model was a civil action. Um, I, again, I, I started work at this law firm after the events in that case, which I think were in the 80s or something. It was a toxic contamination case in Woburn, Massachusetts. Um, but it was fascinating because I knew the people who were discussed in the book, they were my, my supervisors, they became my partners, one of whom was played by Robert Duvall, which you know looked nothing like the guy in real life. But, but it, it, it occurred to me that like, this, is, this is the kind of story that, that people are interested in and, and that they'll understand and that they'll remember 30 years later. Um, and so I, I prepped, I read a lot of John Grisham, Michael Crichton, you know, it's a sorts of thriller writers um, and analyzed like sort of how long scenes would have to be in order to, you know, not drag on um, and how, how to um, capture an audience. I, I was also inspired by The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, uh, which is by Rebecca Skloot, um, much more 2010 book, award-winning book, uh, which is, in, in, about a different topic, but a related topic, um, also involving bioethics and genetics and biology and cancer. Um, and that's in a very engaging book also. And so I read a lot of exemplars and did my best to try to, uh, to imitate them. And I used note cards. Um, I know this sounds utterly primitive and uh, old fashioned, but I have a like a recipe box full of note cards with tabs. And, you know, I've every topic like BRCA testing, the Supreme Court justices, there's a little tab for them. And, and I'm, when I was writing the chapter, I'd spread out the note cards, you know, for that topic. And I'd try to get in, you know, as much as I could, you know, but uh, I know I had to do it in a short, a short way um, and not drone on and on there. Uh, the, the one concession my publisher did make me is I, I, there are a lot of notes in the back 
Um, and there's a lot of good stuff in those notes, you know, take, take a look at the notes uh, if, if you really want to see uh, like uh, real world examples of, of a lot of this stuff. But Well, thank you for that. It was really a joy to read. And I actually have been to the DC ACLU's national office and you, you brought me back there. So um, highly recommend. It's a page turner. And I'd like now to turn to the audience here with us in case there are any questions. Yes, sir. And I'll probably repeat the question for our audience at home. What, what arguments were advanced to, to defend the patent and also to support the proposed legislation, basically to reverse the decision? What arguments were advanced to protect the patents and to continue with this legislation? Yeah. So, so, so I can respond with respect to the arguments to support the patents, right? This is the argument that the patent office had sort of made all along and that all the holders of these patents had. It said, we all accept that you can't patent the product of nature, the mushroom in the forest, the, uh, the mineral that you find in the ground in its natural state. But at the end of the day, everything is made from the naturally occurring elements, right? I mean, I make a new automobile transmission, well, it's made of metals that are, you know, base elements and, uh, you know, everything at some point comes from the natural world. And so the patent law draws a line somewhere like, where is it that you're trying to patent a naturally occurring substance? And where is it a product of human ingenuity, right? And where that line is, is what the courts challenges. They have to determine where it is. So in the case of the genes, what did people do? Well, inside of the nuclei of our cells, we have these chromosomes. Each chromosome uh, has thousands of genes lined up on it, right? But they're, they're all on this long string of DNA and the genes aren't differentiated, right? If you just, you know, quote unquote, looked at a chromosome, you would have no idea where one gene started and the next one uh, ended or the next one began. Um, and there's actually a lot of blank space in between the genes and even within the genes, it's, it's not trivial to figure this out. So, We've got the chromosome, you can't patent a chromosome, but if instead you take that long chromosome and chop it up and you chop out the piece that is the BRCA gene, and then you, you clone it, you make millions of copies of that BRCA gene, which is what's done in the laboratory, that doesn't exist in nature, right? That freestanding, quote unquote, isolated and purified gene doesn't exist in ourselves. Um, and so the theory was that this is a new composition of matter. It's a new thing. It's like a new metallic alloy that we made, or it's like, you know, the analogy used in the Supreme Court, which again, is full of these crazy analogies. You know, the branch of the tree, I can't patent that. But if I chop off the branch and I carve it into a baseball bat, well, then I can patent the baseball bat, even though it's made out of wood and that wood was from the tree. So the gene, once I yank it out of that chromosome, and I know I'm not doing justice to the actual process, <laughs> but I yank it out of the chromosome, it's freestanding. Now it's a new thing. It's like the baseball bat and I can patent it. Um, and the Supreme Court eventually said, no, that, that analogy does not fly. But, but that was the reason. Um, the legislation is far more pragmatic. It's like, well, we don't like that result. So, uh, you know, you should be able to patent uh, products of nature. I don't know if you have anything to say about the more recent legislation. And that legislation, by the way, it died in 2019. Things like COVID started to happen um, that derailed a lot of legislative efforts uh, in, in, in many areas. But it, it is coming back. Um, just this summer, the Patent Office issued a call uh, for um, anyone who wanted to, for the public companies or individuals to submit comments to the patent office about how they were being affected by Supreme Court decisions that um, eliminated certain types of inventions from patentability. And lots of responses were given. Uh, they were due in September. The patent office is still analyzing those responses. But, but that questionnaire, that call for comments was, was requested of the patent office by Senator Tillis um, and others presumably uh, to support legislation um, in, in the coming term. Lynn, do you care to comment on the legislation piece? 
Um, well, I don't have too much to say about that. I, I have to admit I was surprised uh, when we learned about this. Um, I, I, I had thought that the matter had been pretty much settled by the Supreme Court. Um, but uh, as George says, it, it, it will probably keep coming back. Um, uh, and I, I guess I would just say that as, as scientists, um, we are almost completely united in our opposition to gene patenting. Um, it's very hard to find a human geneticist uh, who, would, who would favor reinstatement of gene patenting. Um, so uh, we will continue to oppose it because we, we, think it's, we think it's wrong, we think it's harmful. Okay, thank you for that. Um, this is just a footnote aside for perhaps the future research project. I'm wondering if the same coalition of actors that came together to bring this lawsuit have been assembled to give comments to the patent office. I want to doubt that because it becomes, again, the practice of the patent bar and less the public civil rights issue. Um, what are you seeing? Have you reviewed these? Yes, yes. And uh, so uh, the ACLU is uh, is now following this issue, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, Chris Hansen retired and, and Tanya Simoncelli is no longer there, but Sandra Park, uh, who was the attorney from the Women's Rights Project, who became one of the lead attorneys um, on the case, she's still there and she's following these issues. And so the ACLU did collect a coalition of um, interested people and organizations to submit comments to the patent office. As, and, and there's a group called FORCE, Facing Our Risk of Cancer Empowered. This is the advocacy and support group for carriers of the BRCA mutations, um, which has become quite active and um, is, is very well informed in, in these areas uh, now. Certainly they were involved in the case um, and they're, they're watching the issues too. So, so there, is, there is definitely uh, that other voice uh, giving input into the process. And so maybe you have a sequel. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna take um, a question from um, our, our screen here, though it's from Chris Peterson, one of our colleagues. Can you tell us more about what happened to the Myriad, Gene what happened to Myriad, Myriad Genetics, the company, after the Supreme Court overturned their patent? Has business found alternative gene adjacent patents on technology that are functionally the same from a business perspective? Um, basically, this might be a question about Myriad's bottom line. How are they doing? What are they doing these days? Well, I, I can I can start. Myriad's doing pretty well. Um, so, for those who don't know, they're they're here basically on campus in Research Park. Um, they keep expanding. <laughs> they, in fact, they, I I just went over there to uh, deliver a book to somebody there, and um, they they they've. They keep expanding. I mean, so so Myriad A, it, it has other businesses uh, other than BRCA testing. They they have a lot of diagnostic tests. Um, and uh, but besides that, I mean, there's more to the diagnostic testing business than than patents. Um, Myriad is still the number one provider of BRCA tests, as far as I know. Uh, genetic counselors still widely recommend Myriad's test as the gold standard. It's it's still covered. Now it is covered by Medicare, Medicaid at a lower price, but still about $2,000-ish, something like not. It's not hundreds of dollars. It's still, you know, relatively high price test. Now it is covered. Um, and, and they're still doing quite a lot of business. So there are competitors, uh, which again, I think is healthy for any market, um, but, but the testing business is, is growing. Um, and, and again, more and more, um, genes and uh, genetic uh, uh, indicators are being found for different health conditions, and so so the business the business seems to be thriving even without the patents, in, in my view. Yeah, I, I would I would pretty much agree with that, George. And one thing that um, Myriad still has going in its favor, first of all, it is it is a good quality test, um, but the other thing is that because they have done millions now of tests, they have an enormous database of the consequences of the different variants that you find in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Uh, and that gives that continues to give them a real advantage. Uh, and uh, they, they really tout that advantage uh, that uh, they have a very good di diagnostic capability because 
uh, if I have a BRCA1 variant, uh, it may not be known how harmful that variant is unless you have a database of all the other people who have had that variant and what, uh, what consequences it had. And that is proprietary. Uh, so uh, it, it, it has helped to maintain their advantage. Although the scientific community is making their own, our own database where we are freely sharing the data with everybody. Uh, so I think that advantage of theirs is beginning to erode. Thank you. Um, other questions from the audience? Okay. I will take the liberty of asking you this question. What question do you wish people would ask you <laughs> about this that you haven't had? Um, so George is on a book tour. He's been to Boston. Um, he's been back home to our alma mater, Harvard. Um, what has been what you wish people were curious about? You know, one of the things that I never thought this book would be about um, is, is sort of the broader picture of how law is made in the United States in a common law system. Um, and, and I mentioned this in interviews and, 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 and none of the interviewers ever really seemed that interested in this. So I'll, I thank you for asking that open-ended question. But, but it is fascinating, right? In, in most countries, the law is much more rigid um, in that there's a civil code in you know, say France, Germany, Japan, there's a civil code and that lists out all of the rules. And in the patent code, it'll say these, what can and can not be patented. And that'll be, that'll be the law. Um, in the United States, legislation is often written in a very broad and general manner. So again, the Patent Act, all it says is you can patent you know, machines, processes, manufacturers, and uh, compositions of matter. Right. It doesn't say what a composition of matter is. Um, that definition is left to the courts, and it has been for 200 years. Um, and, and the courts can change uh, what they think, and they can continue to refine um, those, those definitions. Because in 1790, when the first Patent Act was drafted, obviously none of this was even remotely imaginable. Um, so the world changes, science advances. And our legal system enables us to keep up with it. Um, we don't necessarily do it fast enough, um, but we do have a system that, that allows courts to adapt to changing science, changing technology in ways that are beneficial uh, to society. And, and the fact that change can be brought about by outside observers, people like the ACLU who just see something happening that seems wrong and not in sync with what their intuitive understanding is, then, then they can mount a challenge. Um, much more difficult to do that in, in a civil law system, right, where you have to go through a legislative process. So, so I think that's a really interesting and, and amazing feature of, of the common law, which gets, you know, bad mouth all the time in legal circles. But I, I'm a firm believer in it. I, I think it, it works uh, when, when it's used properly. Okay, wonderful. There was a question that came in from the chat function I'm reading. Um, back to legislation again. What arguments are being advanced to support the legislation to overturn this decision? The arguments are that uh, there is a fight, the, the, the industry is being hurt, right? That um, without patents, there's uh, research and development isn't, there's not gonna be an incentive to do R&D in this area. Companies aren't gonna be formed in the United States. We're gonna lose out to other countries, China, Europe, um, who are is still issuing patents in some of these areas. And, and so there's a competition and uh, incentive and innovation argument being made. Okay, so stay tuned for the sequel. And then um, this is a question that perhaps is for you, Lynn. Did the Department of Health um, do newborn screening? Somebody is curious about genetic screening of newborns and whether Myriad has a stake in that? I, I think we'd need somebody from there to answer this, but if you have anything um, to say not, on it. Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, the, uh, the state health department does screen for more than 50 different conditions in newborns, um, but I'm, uh, they, I'm quite sure they don't do it through Myriad. Okay. And it isn't 
quite intersecting with gene patents since we don't have patents on genes anymore, at least not right now. Okay. Um, so then my last question to you both would be for the lay audience who aren't scientists, who aren't patent lawyers, what is the central takeaway of this story for us? Whether something we need to act on, something we need to learn more about, something we need to do. The, the, I mean, I think I, what I hope this book does is demonstrates that non-experts can understand these issues. Um, you, you don't need a law degree and a PhD in biochemistry, right, to engage with these issues, at least to the extent that they affect the public, right? You're not going to go and, you know, write a patent for a new drug, but you can understand the effect that patents have on, on ordinary people and, and society. And they're big, big effects where there are huge patent debates going on right now around COVID-19 vaccines. This is a big international debate, um, but it is, a lot of the debate is very uninformed um, on, on both sides. And, and I think that you don't need a super technical background to understand enough to, um, you know, to, to understand what proposals are uh, in, in an intelligent way. I'm, I'm highly opposed to, uh, to spin and lobbyist talk, um, which, which tries to uh, distort like what's actually going on. Try to understand the issues um, and uh, do something about them. Write, write to your Congress people, contribute to the ACLU, um, you know, the, the, the method of your choice to, uh, to stay involved. Wonderful. Thank you. Lynn? I, I think George summed things up very well. Um, but I, I think the whole story that, that he has told um, really does tell us something about uh, public understanding of science uh, and public faith in science. And I, I'll just have to say, in these last couple of years, it's been really disappointing to see science uh, often denigrated uh, for what I view as political reasons. Um, and I hope that the scientific community and the community in general will uh, kind of resurrect uh, a, a greater respect for science. I think uh, the fact that Eric Lander is now a member of the president's cabinet, uh, I, I really welcome that development and look forward to, to more things like that. Okay, and again, for our lay audience who may not know who Eric Lander is. He is in the book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Eric Lander is a, a, a very prominent member of the genetics community. He was uh, heavily involved in the Human Genome Project um, and, um, uh, uh, well, uh, had, a, had, uh, had a lot to do with the case, the uh, patent case, um, and, um, uh, and it also happens to be very, very eloquent, well-spoken, and excellent communicator. Uh, so uh, I think, I think he, he will be a good advocate for us uh, in the current administration. Wonderful. And I guess I'll just close out by saying, wearing both my law and humanities hat, um, this is a wonderful story. We know that the last chapter is not written, and it could be that stories do save us, ultimately, telling better stories, accurate stories about science, um, telling stories about how we can be involved and have some self-sovereignty over ourselves and participate in our government. And ultimately, stories are how we understand our relationship to the world, our relationship to ourselves, and our relationship to one another. So um, to those of you who have come to be with us tonight, we are greatly appreciative of your relationship with us and the S.J. Quinney College of Law. Um, I invite you to join me in thanking my colleague, George Catreas, and our guest, Lynn, um, Jordy, Lynn Jordy, um, I didn't do the introductions, and in, um, our Dean, um, Elizabeth Cronk Warner, for welcoming us to this space. Thank you so very much for joining us tonight. Um, oh, last question was, where can you buy this book? just outside. We have our dear friends from the King's English Bookstore, an independent bookstore, um, independently owned in Salt Lake City for many decades, um, under the leadership of Betsy Burton, who's now turned over to new partners. So please um, join us outside for a welcome reception and a book signing with our author. Thank you once again. Thank you both.